Lab 7, Carbohydrate Catabolism, by me and Rachel. Alright, so cellular respiration is a process by which living cells obtain energy and release products, the goal being ATP production. Aerobic respiration occurs when oxygen gas is used. Um, three energy intermediates involved in cellular respiration include um, ATP, NADH, and FADH2. All right, glycolysis is essentially splitting <coughs> or lysing sugars. Um, a glucose molecule is broken down into two, three carbon pyruvate molecules. <coughs> Sorry, and um, which makes sense given glucose's chemical formula C6H12O6. Um, this produces a net gain of two ATP and two NADH molecules. Um, the ATPs are generated through substrate-level phosphorylation, in which an enzyme known as a kinase transfers a phosphate to ADP, changing, it for, changing the diphosphate to a triphosphate. In eukaryotes, glycolysis occurs in the cytosol. The um, two pyruvate molecules are each broken down um, into two carbon acetyl groups and one CO2 molecule. Okay, in the citric acid cycle, each acetyl group is incorporated into um, an organic molecule, which is later oxidized to form two CO2 molecules. One ATP, three NADH, and one FADH2 are made in the process. Because there are um, two acetyl groups, one from each pyruvate molecule, the total yield is four CO2, two ATP, six NADH, and two FADH molecules. Um, this process occurs in the mitochondrial matrix for oxidative phosphorylation. NADH and FADH have high energy electrons that can be transferred to other molecules via redox reactions. Once oxidized from these intermediates, the electrons release energy, which is then harnessed to produce an H plus um, electrochemical gradient. In chemiosmosis, energy stored in this gradient is used to synthesize ATP from ADP and organic phosphate. ADP becomes phosphorylated in the process. Uh, okay, the electron transport chain. Um, it's composed of proteins and molecules embedded in the inner mitochondrial membrane. They pass electrons from one component to the next via redox reactions. NADH and FADH2 are um, energy intermediates that donate their electrons at different points in the chain. The final electron acceptor, as we know, is oxygen. The energy released from the electron movement is um, used to pump H plus ions across the membrane, and the flow of H plus ions across wait the flow of H plus ions back into the matrix is an exergonic reaction. Um, so it's like a downhill process which passes through ATP synthase and harnesses free energy um, to release. Wait, free energy release from H plus flow to synthesize ATP, if that makes sense. Um, anyway, okay, so for this specific lab, um, we found that rate is very important. The rate of chemical reactions is regulated by enzymes such as kinases, dehydrogenases, and isomerases, which all transfer energy in different ways, and I'm not really going to get into that, but um, we can measure the rate of chemical reactions by looking at uh, how much reactant gets used or the amount of product. Germination refers to the process by which seeds grow into plants and it's marked by rapid cell growth. Germinated peas require more energy, which we know if we look at the CO2 production. Um, we prevented this gas from dispersing in the air by submerging the tubes in water. So the oxidation of glucose yields CO2, and when CO2 reacts with water, it forms um, carbonic acid which we measured using an indicator called phenol red, and also by looking at pH. Here we have experiment one. So we're testing the impact of enzymes on the rate of respiration. Our hypothesis is that the peas, which are at a high temperature, will have a high rate of respiration. Our materials are three jars of peas, two of them being germinated and one of them ungerminated, 
and then a beaker of water with boiling chips, a hot plate, and experimental apparatus. Here is our design. Our experimental design for our first experiment is as follows. First, you prepare a water bath at 135 degrees Celsius. You boil the germinated peas for about 10 minutes. So here I have a little animation. There are the peas. And 10 minutes. So here's an actual picture that we have of the peas when they were boiling. The peas were then placed in room temperature water for about five minutes. This beaker represents room temperature water, by the way. Okay, so the three types of peas provided, which were germinated, which we just boiled, and germinated, which was not boiled, and then the ungerminated, should then be placed into three separate containers, respectively. Oh, sorry about that. Okay. So, going into their respective containers. Once this is done, the rubber stoppers can be inserted in tubes, uh, which will be then placed into the respiration tubes. Here, as the animation shows. Um, so then we have the rubber tubing, and it gets put into water-filled test tubes here. And you have to make sure that the tubing is submerged. And the reason for this is so you ensure that the end of the tubing um, will trap any released CO2. So if you take a look at this little red circle we provide as a part of the animation representing the CO2, it's unable to escape from the rubber tubing at the test tube top, and it can't go down from there because the water is blocking it. That's pretty much how this experiment's working. So now we can wait for 60 minutes and we have shown you a picture of our experiment at this point. After the hour has passed, the water in the test tube should be quickly replaced with the phenol red dye. Now this makes the CO2 visible as yellow, carbon, uh, yellow carbonic acid. So removing the rubber stoppers, water should be added slowly up to the corners. Here we have the beakers, and they're filling up the water right up to where this arrow shows you at the rightmost beaker. This first picture shows you the experiment prior to exchanging the water in the test tubes with the phenol red. The second picture shows the experiment after we added the water to the respiration containers. Unfortunately, our experiment went a little bit haywire when we replaced all the water test tubes at once with the phenol red. And since we did the exchange a little bit too slowly, much of the CO2 produced escaped. And this is why our conclusions show different results than the expected correct outcomes. But in any case, the production of CO2 is indicated by a yellow color since carbonic acid is created when CO2 reacts with H2O. And the phenol red measures this and indicates it. So although much of the CO2 produced was released, the presence of a carbonic acid in the ungerminated peas' test tube at least indicates that some of the peas underwent cellular respiration because that carbonic acid formed.